Hello and welcome to this Australia Papua New Guinea Network special event here at the Lowy Institute. My name is Jonathan Pryke, Director of the Pacific Islands Program here at the Lowy Institute. We are coming to you today from Sydney, which is on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying tribute to the traditional owners their, and their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to thank the, the supporters of the AusPNG Network Project for their ongoing support, the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and our event sponsors, Bank of South Pacific and Coca-Cola Amatool. We're pleased to be able to host this event today to talk about the biggest issue in the PNG Australia relationship at the moment, the global pandemic of COVID-19. PNG has been particularly hard hit by this pandemic in recent weeks. An explosion of case numbers in the nation's capital has sent alarm bells ringing, but the true picture is a nationwide sustained stretch of community transmission that's seen case numbers skyrocket. To discuss the latest on COVID-19 and PNG, I'm pleased to be joined by PNG's Health Minister, the Honourable Delta Wong, MP. Minister Wong has been the member for Gazelle of East New Britain in PNG's parliament since 2017 and was first appointed to the health portfolio back in 2019. He regained the post late last year, quickly finding himself in the middle of the government's response to this pandemic. Delta Wong, thank you for joining me. Thank you, gentlemen. Good to see you again. Great to see you too. Minister, we've got, only got you for a limited amount of time here, so let's jump straight into it. You were among the first uh, group of people in PNG to receive the vaccination this week. How did it all go? And how are you feeling now? Uh, I'm feeling great. Uh, one of the reasons why we, we stood up to take the vaccine first is to show our people, especially our health workers who had doubts that, it, um, that the vaccine was untrue or there's a series of uh, issues around the vaccine just to show them that we we took it and we've come out of it normal and it's protecting us more than anything else. Well, that's that's great to hear, Minister. And I do want to come back to this point of misinformation because it does seem to be a critical one, uh, impediment for, for the rollout of the vaccine in the country. But before we get there, uh, the news we see in Australia coming out of PNG is very concerning. As a close watcher and I hope a friend of, of Papua New Guinea, I've been watching with a mixture of anxiety and alarm. Uh, but what is the situation on, on the ground? How is the pandemic trending in Papua New Guinea? We, we are alarmed. Um, we're also working every day to mitigate, to make sure that it doesn't go overboard. Um, there's new uh, facilities we're opening up to ensure that we cater for people within the city. Outside of the city, it's a different story. Most of our little towns and villages um, live a distance from each other. It's only the ones that are very close, close knit communities where you can see the transmission move really quick. But in most of uh, rural areas within our country, they, they live far apart. And with some of the our members going out there, and as well as our NDOH going out there and telling people that they can isolate within their houses. And because of the food intake of, of our local people and the, the, the nutritious greens that we, we have up here, it sort of slowed down the pandemic outside of the city. And it's within the city that is our biggest worry, um, where there's close knit of, of people and the population is very, uh, it's huge. And um, we don't have the, the hospital space to, to mitigate it, to look after the, the people that are coming in at, the, at this point of time. But we have already opened up the another Aquatic, the aquatic center to cater for that. And then we've got another two uh, post sites to open up within the next month or so, so that we make sure that we have space for our people. So Minister, would you say that in the in the urban areas in Papua New Guinea, and you know, I note that we have, we do see cases in almost every province in the country, would you say that uh, it's, a, it's a situation of crisis? In, in our urban centers, yes, because uh, per capita, we we lose people on um, we lose people every day, and it 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 uh, our people sometimes they don't think that it's it's the COVID uh, it's COVID, but we we have information that that is tied to COVID, and that's why we we in the urban areas we we try to like for East New Britain for example we have put up isolation centers and within the hospital itself, it's, it's full. And most of our health, 
facilities, their staff are getting COVID now. So the the two weeks of isolation for those staff is causing a huge problem for us is because we have to look for uh, volunteer staff to, to man uh, our hospitals while our, our frontliners are done. That's why the vaccine rollout was is, is very important. Mm. And, you know, the, and it's a health system already dealing with so many other really significant health challenges that putting COVID on top of it all is just a real, uh, a, a real difficult situation for, for the health sector to be in. Uh, but I did want to come back to this question on, on data. You know, we, we, um, we regularly hear that the testing and data about the scale of the outbreak isn't showing the true picture. What do you think about the government's data and why do you think it's so difficult to get, a, to get the real picture of the COVID uh, situation in PNG? Well, firstly, it's because we we don't do enough testing, uh, and that's that's our biggest uh, our biggest problem. We we don't do enough testing, and when COVID first hit uh, Papua New Guinea, I was health minister for two months or something. So I came into the health system, a forty five year old, fifty year old health system that has been struggling to capacity just to keep going, and. Uh, we first thing I wanted to do was to make big changes within NDOH to stabilize the whole country. But we have already, government before I had already um, created reforms within, within the health uh, space. And once we got through the nitty gritty of, of what uh, the PNG health system was like, I, through government, through this government, I've been pushing for more funding to go into to building the infrastructure, but halfway, not even halfway, a month or two into my tenure as the health minister, COVID-19 hit. And from that day, from that day, we've been on the move, trying to mitigate it. And then we came into the, we came into the end of last year where I was moved from the health ministry because we had low numbers and everything. And, we became complacent and people started to think that because we weren't getting COVID-19 in Papua New Guinea, uh, we, we, were, we were never gonna get it. So they moved me to civil aviation. And then after the impasse, I was moved back to health to take over this uh, pandemic that has risen. The people didn't realize that it, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it takes a while for the for the virus to spread through the country. And it, through the Christmas break, through the Christmas break when everyone was out celebrating and not thinking about COVID because we had a whole year where we had our numbers really down. Uh, they just relaxed and, and, the, and the numbers started going right through the country. So we, we have a lot of issues uh, that we're still working on and we're trying to make sure that we with the, this next isolation uh, program that we're having with the NCC, we, we slow down the movement of people so that the virus doesn't move into the provinces. Mm. Uh, that all, does all sound very challenging and I don't envy you being thrown into the deep end like you have been to, to manage this crisis. But on, on a more optimistic note, you have just had the vaccine, part of eight, a batch of 8,000 rapidly dispersed from Australia. But the question is, what comes next? What, what plans do you have for a national rollout? And what are going to be some of the barriers in making a, 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 a larger scale vaccination program a reality? Well, thank you to Australia that we, we got our first 8,000 vaccines and, and we're, we're making sure that our frontliners get it first. Uh, we also on the, the COVAX uh, list there to get more vaccines. Um, we've never had in this country, we've never had an adult vaccine go up. We've always uh, had the children's one. And that has worked really well. Um, it's going to be a real challenge for us to do this vaccination rollout, but we have a plan. Uh, NDOH, as well as our logistics uh, teams, have come up with a plan that we could roll out uh, as the vaccines come in. So we're, we're trying to push into, into rural areas. And, and the biggest thing with the vaccination rollout will be education. Our people need to be educated enough to know that this vaccine will help them in the future. 
and with all the doom they say is coming out and saying all these things, it just makes life a lot harder for as a struggling country with a health system that's struggling, we're trying to explain to them and give them uh, a very good uh, vaccine to to help them prolong their lives. You know, Papua New Guinea's uh, Papua New Guinea's way of, of living was never to to go. Uh, you know how in Australia you can, if you feel that there's a vaccine there to stop you from getting the flu, your people go there and you get the vaccine and then it stops you from getting the flu. Our people are not like that. Our people, live, when they feel sick and they feel like they're about to die, they go to the hospital. And then they ask for these things. So we're trying to we're trying to change the mindset by getting them to go early, get vaccinated, and then live their life. And of course, one of the biggest challenges with, uh, with this education campaign will be combating misinformation. Uh, you know, we, we get a lot of misinformation here in Australia. We have a lot of anti-vaxxers here too, but it seems like in PNG, it's at a whole nother scale. This misinformation seems to be spreading across a lot of the middle class. And, um, and what, what, do, what do you think is driving this? Is it Facebook? Is it culture? Uh, and, and how, like, what, what's going to be the, the uh, how are you going to overcome this, this challenge? That's a great question. It, it's, it comes down to Facebook and social media. Everybody becomes an expert. Papua New Guinea, when Facebook hit Papua New Guinea, everybody became an expert. Everybody had a PhD. Even <laughs> sitting under a coconut tree, they became a PhD. So Facebook has given a medium to people. Whether they work or not, or whether they sit on the street, they can say something that other people will believe. There's always one person or two or three or four people that will believe what they say. And that, that is our biggest challenge. You know, when people tell us that Bill Gates is behind all this, you know, how can we say Bill Gates is behind it when the machines that we're using to better the life of our humans come from a person like that? Or his family is giving money to, to uh, fundraising events, the, one of the biggest philanthropists in the world, you know, and then some nutcase turns around and puts it on Facebook that. He's the guy that started the COVAX thing. And then it just generates through Facebook. I think Facebook is, is our biggest uh, conspiracy theorist uh, platform. Um, before, you know, they go through the proper channels where uh, they can, if they have a vaccine, like just for example, someone has a vaccine, someone has a type of vaccine or a type of medication that may help people and they've used it in the bush, you know, bush, bush type medicine. So we have protocols. We'll bring it down to NDOH. It goes through the scientific system. It goes through the WHO. They check it all out and then they send it back to you and say, yes, you can use that. But no, these people go straight to Facebook, use Facebook as their advertising point, which Facebook gives them the opportunity to do and then they sell it on the streets. This is dangerous, this is very dangerous. And this is a type of things like we have a million more people in, in our country that just sit on Facebook because it's cheap, it's easy, and they can get their opinion up. That's all it is. So Minister, would you say Facebook has some responsibility here? Is, do we need to be co-opting them into helping with this misinformation, with this campaign against misinformation? I think Facebook has a lot of influence here and they need to be held responsible for some of the, the information that they leak out. Like most of it, if, if, I, if I take you through Facebook now, some of the stuff that it is unbelievably not true and, and they still push it out. And they, you know, they're supposed to have uh, programs where it stops these type of things. Like Facebook for me is, like I use it, I, I use it. I use it to connect with my family. And, and that's probably about it. And then probably in the health space is to use it to get information out for people to make sure that they get vaccinated or there's a drug here, a new drug for babies or something. This, that's what I use Facebook for. So 
in that sense, it's great. But when you put it to a person that has a lot of time on their hands and wants to sit there and just keep saying the same thing and just to get people to like, to have a like, you know, you know that there's something wrong. And Facebook must take responsibility of this and stop it. Well, it sounds like we need to set up a meeting with the Sydney offices of Facebook uh, pretty quickly. But another yeah, one of the... Yeah. <laughs> Another one of the big hurdles here for, for PNG will just get it, be getting hot, hold of a vaccine. I mean, Australians know this all too well. We're really struggling here to get our rollout moving because of just supply issues. Um, Australia has chipped in with 8,000 doses of our own domestic stockpile uh, to PNG, but that's clearly just the start. I mean, much more is absolutely needed. What kind of support are you looking to, are you receiving from, from uh, partners like Australia and others? And what more support do you think is going to be needed? Well, firstly, I want to thank Australia for being the first to send the 8,000 vaccines here. You know, uh, Papua New Guinea and Australia, people in Australia have a misconception about Papua New Guinea and Australia's relationship, and uh, it goes way back. It, uh, it, it goes decades. And um, thanks to the founding father, the late Michael Thomas Mark, there was a relationship that forged that uh, they became very good friends and neighbours. And, even when you're the Prime Minister now, the Honourable James Marbury and the Honourable Scott Morrison, when they get together, they, there's a relationship there that you can't have with, you can see that it's only between them. We look forward to them helping us with the COVAX uh, vaccine rollout. They have, uh, they've been instrumental. The Australian Foreign Minister, the Prime Minister, Australian Prime Minister, they've been very instrumental in pushing the European Union to allow us to get uh, get up the line in the, in the COVAX uh, line and also to get more vaccines for our country. Um, we're also grateful to India, who are uh, the producers of the AstraZeneca vaccine as well, who have given us 70,000 free um, vaccines. And that comes in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've also got the Chinese government that have given 200,000 of their own vaccines for the citizens of, of their country to be vaccinated. So we're getting, we're getting help from everywhere. And, and it's, it's good help. Help that we like, just the other day from New Caledonia, we, we got the tents that came in to set up a 500, uh, 500 person uh, bed, with ventilators and, and everything. So that eases the burden of the pain because when our health, when I took over the health, they had no plans for this. They had no plans to to build these uh, isolation centers or or anything. We Our plan was to, to build specialist hospitals so that it takes the burden off the provincial hospitals so that people with specialist problems can go to the specialist hospitals. And we were in the process of um, doing all these things and COVID-19 just really blew us apart. And, um, you know, now that we've, we've got a plan towards our future, because we know that COVID is going to be in Papua New Guinea's life for a long time. And we, we believe that the vaccine is, will be the, the key to containing uh, COVID-19 in our country. So just on, on China, Minister, you, you mentioned the 200,000 Sinopharm vaccines that have been uh, offered. Have, has the PNG government now accepted that offer? And uh, what kind of requirements are going to be needed to, to approve that vaccine for distribution in, in Papua New Guinea? Jonathan, everything is about bureaucracy. You know? uh, we, certain countries and certain in, uh, Certain institutions have uh, have different uh, ways of bringing uh, and procuring medicine and, and allowing medicine to be used in the world. So we, as you know, we are very highly involved with WHO, and we follow we follow their advice on on how to get the best medicine for for our people. So the WHO have come up with a solution that the medicine, the vaccine that China is giving is already with WHO. 
they are just waiting uh, for WHO to give us to give a green light. But with us, it's we really asked for a special emergency use only for the Chinese citizens that are within Papua New Guinea, so that uh, this 200,000 can be brought in so that their citizens can be looked after because the government cannot provide for their citizens. Seems reasonable, Minister. Well, uh, thank you for thank you for that answer, uh, you know, Minister. Just another another question for you. We've also seen reports in the past week uh, about alleged mismanagement of funds in the go government's COVID response in 2020, prompting the Prime Minister to order an investigation into the catering contracts for one of the main Port Moresby isolation facility facilities. Our Prime Minister Marape also noted yesterday that his government would use this crisis as an opportunity to strengthen the weaknesses in the country's health systems, as you've already already alluded to. How worried about you, are you about these, these allegations, these specific allegations? And is misappropriation of funds a major issue in the PNG's health system? I, like any, but I came from a private sector, so, you know, it, uh, when you come in from private sector, you go into the public uh, arena, uh, the public service arena, it's a totally different ballgame. Uh, I agree with the, there's an investigation, ongoing investigation with the catering uh, contract. Uh, by right, uh, the lady should not be involved in them, but we have to give the benefit of the doubt to the, to the person and they will be thoroughly investigated. Uh, I can only comment when the investigation is finished. But one of the things that I find that is very very hard to do yeah, and to make changes to, for the betterment of the health department is that the bureaucracy doesn't allow you to, when they see that, that you're trying to ensure that they, they get better things and, and build better infrastructure, the process is, is such a long process. It, it goes to one part of the department to another part of the department and then it sits there for another two months and then it goes through to another another place. So what I try to do is, I try to tell the secretary, you know, you have to find ways to move things. Things cannot wait. Because I'm I'm from the private sector and I don't like to sit idle. I want to move and move and move. And, you know, every day I talk to donor partners from different countries, you know, they have wealth of information and wealth of uh, equipment that they want to bring to our country. But when they do bring it here, it can go to one place and sit there for three or four months. And that just wastes my time as well as their time as why they donated this thing to my country. So I need to strengthen. That was what my plan was to strengthen the foundation of the NDOH, make sure that the corruption and all these things was eradicated from from the department, but sometimes because the NDLH has every other uh, group of institutes that come in between, like you have the National Doctors Association, who sometimes uh, don't want me to get a secretary that's an administrator. And I feel that for the health department to move forward, they need administration skills, skills to that will manage people. Um, they want a doctor there, or they do all these things, and then it becomes a real political game that we end up playing. Sounds very, very challenging, Minister. And you know, cutting red tape seems to be a challenge for every bureaucracy across the globe, uh, and especially it seems in, in in Papua New Guinea. Another challenge in the health system is just, uh, I think, which has been revealed quite clearly in this in this crisis, is just the the, the number of health workers in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and and the 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 average age of these health workers, you know, they are. Um, is it, a question we I'm asking is, uh, are there enough new health workers coming into the PNG system? How can we improve the, the number of health workers coming in? So doctors, nurses, ancillary support, you know, you name it, um, coming into the system. Yeah, coming into the system, we have a lot of uh, nurses, uh, not as many doctors as I would like. Um, but we don't have a workforce that is big enough for this country. That is the bottom line. Uh, we need to look outside and 
and uh, bring in expertise where they could help with the uh, with the specialist uh, hospitals and especially training for for our nurses and some of our HEOs. I mean, some of our nurses. Don't get me wrong. Some of our nurses are, are world class. You you will get one nurse in a rural area that can do more things. That can do something that the doctor can do. That if this happened in Australia, she would be taken to court. And these are the type of nurses that are built on experience and, and many years of, of doing doing things. And that's why when you see most of our apos, they are they're, they're looked after by nurses. And the doctor does a patrol once or twice a week just to check on the nurses and, and make sure there's like if there's an emergency procedure or that the doctor takes over. But I, I give credit to the nurses about some of the sought after nurses in the world uh, through the experience. And, and every every province I think now has a nursing school. So we're building, we're building uh, capacity for nurses. And my worry is the, uh, the doctors, we, we should be, we should be giving them a bit more training and a lot more perks and the privileges to to stay within country and and, and work here. Like some of our doctors are now living across the world and have better, uh, I'd say, better working privileges and packages elsewhere than they do here in, in our country. And the ones that stay behind are good, patriotic to to making sure that they make a difference for our country. Well, I think we can all agree that uh, it's the, the Herculean effort of the health workers in PNG is one of the main reasons that the, the, the COVID situation is, um, is being held at, at bay as best as it can be. Um, now, before we leave you, Minister, and thank you again for being so generous with your time with us today, uh, we do have a few questions from some of our audience. Uh, the first is from Sarah Kuman, who asks, does the PNG government have a vaccine rollout plan that can be made public? Uh, and what can members of the public, including companies, or sorry, when can members of the public, including companies, expect to get access to uh, vaccinations? That's a good question. We do have a rollout plan. I have it right in front of me, it's right here. And what we'll do is uh, after our next meeting, when we have, uh, when we approve, the vaccination plan. We will uh, put it on our website and every other medium that we can to make sure that everybody's ready. Uh, through the companies getting vaccinations, there's a bit of a policy uh, layover that we're still trying to, to work out to ensure that uh, everyone gets a fair, fair share of the vaccine and it's at the right price, the price that uh, is affordable for every public getting. That's, I think I'm sure that is very welcome news for our audience. Um, we have another question regarding the Mount Hagen General Hospital. During the crisis, the hospital has been closed, citing a lack of funds. Uh, how serious do you think this issue is and what are the plans to resolve it? Yeah, the Mount Hagen uh, General Hospital is, is probably the, the largest uh, outside of uh, Port Moresby and it caters for five different provinces. At the moment, we are building Three different hospitals within the vicinity of the provinces that are that are come to Manhattan. So that should take some of the burden, but that won't be ready for another six to eight months or uh, to a year. Um, we are working with Treasury at the moment to ensure that we we get some funding up to Manhattan General Hospital to ensure that they keep the doors open and they get volunteers uh, to replace some of the doctors that are down sick or the nurses. That's the same thing that we have in Kokopo, in Wunapopi. Most of our staff are down with COVID. Uh, and we're just looking at uh, volunteers and, and how to how to get them to start working within the system to, to keep the hospitals open. Thank you, Minister. And final question uh, from Ben Packham from the Australian newspaper here in Australia. He Hello, asked... Ben. <laughs> Ben asks, how many people does PNG want to vaccinate? Is it everyone? And if so, by, by when? 
So if if I had my my way, everyone will be vaccinated, but we've given a, a choice to people. Uh, we're a democratic country. The prime minister has has given them a choice whether they want to be vaccinated or not. But as a responsible government, we should have enough vaccine, vaccines in the country to ensure that everybody that wants to be vaccinated will be vaccinated. And we should have within the next three or four months enough uh, stuff to allow uh, people to who want to be vaccinated to, to be vaccinated and we can get it out to the provinces. Thank you, Minister. I mean, we could go on talking about these challenges all day, but I'm conscious we're actually taking you away from your time and addressing these challenges and helping to fix them. Uh, but I do want to leave with you as saying you have my sincere, and I think everyone at the Institute's sincere, and indeed in Australia's sincere uh, best wishes and uh, best of luck to addressing the significant challenges you're dealing with with the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so thank you to Minister Wong for joining us today. And remember that we published a daily news summary at our AusPNG Network website to help you keep tabs on the latest from Papua New Guinea. Thank you, uh, Minister Wong. Thanks, Jonathan. And uh, thank you for your support always. Uh, next time when the borders open up, uh, I hope to see you up here again. Don't you worry, mate. I'll be on one of the first flights. I, I can't wait to get back to your beautiful country. <laughs> no worries. Take care. God bless. Thank you, Minister. And thanks today to our event sponsors, BSP and Coca-Cola Amatol for their ongoing support for the AusPNG network and to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for its ongoing financial support of this project. We'll be back again soon with another AusPNG network event. We look forward to seeing you again soon.